What does it take to become an elite 40K player? How do the top competitors overcome bad dice? The Competitive 40K Network presents Art of War Unbroken. Insight into the game plans of the top players on the planet with your hosts, Blake Law and the Art of War Coaches. Hello and welcome to Art of War Unbroken. Champions may lose, but their spirits remain unbroken. I'm your host, Blake Law. This is episode 18 of the podcast, and we're glad you're able to join us today. They say we learn the most from our losses, and that's exactly what this podcast aims to do. We interview elite players who have lost one to two games at a major event. We break down their mistakes. We talk about how they plan to learn from them and just that elite player mindset. How often have you blamed a game on bad dice? We've all done it. That is what this podcast aims to debunk. We all know and love Goonhammer, so of course we're going to love talking about the Goonhammer Open that happened last weekend. Not only that, but we have one of the goons or the gooners or the goom hammerers on today's episode. And even better, they're playing Imperial Guard and they had some pretty awesome success with it. Now this is part one of the episode, so in this part we will be analyzing the game. We'll be talking about common mistakes, their secondary choices, target priority, and all the stuff in between. And part two, which is available to subscribers at theartofwar40k.com, we will be diving into strategy adjustments they plan to make. We'll be talking about list adjustments. We'll be analyzing their matchup into combat-centric armies, shooting armies, a mix of the two. And we'll be talking about just that elite player mindset. My co-host today can be found on his OnlyFans page, Brad the Chess Chester. He is also known as Brad Eldos. Nine-time member of Team USA. He won some Adepticons at some point. He is a three-time Top 8 LVO finisher. He won the Arms Forces GT this year. He won 2021 ACO, Mr. Brad Chester. Ah, so early today. We're ready to rock and roll and talk about little bros, dudes playing guard, so many little guys running around with las guns, flashlights hitting everybody. Is it is it still appropriate to call them IG or Imperial Guard? Is that like a, a, a will, bad term now? IG forever, buddy. I don't care what their their real their new name is. They'll be IG. IG for life. Well, you know, I, I set out for like uh, four editions, and I came back and like all the all the armies have like wacky names, and I'm still I'm still learning. It's like a year later, and I still am like learning Drakari and like Astra Militarum and all this nonsense. I'm just gonna call them Dark Eldar and Imperial Guard. You know, stay true to the stay true to it. Like everything so, about this. So our guest today is one of the big contributors to Goom Hammer. He's won many GTs over the years. He's a champion of Imperial Guard. What is the correct term for someone who is a member of the Goon Hammer? Is it a is it a goon, a gooner? We have Mr. Scott Horace with us today. Scott, can you answer that question for us? Hey guys, thanks for having me on. Um, I think the the official name is Goon. Goon. Okay, so you're you're a goon. Yeah, there's some there's some namespace collision there. Thank you. Oh, perfect. Hired yeah, thank, goon. Thank you, goon. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah, I like that. I like that a lot. So why don't you tell us a little bit about the event this last weekend? So you are one of the members of Goonhammer. So tell us a little bit about Goonhammer and about the Goonhammer Open. Okay. So uh, Goonhammer is a, a hobby blog, uh, Goonhammer.com. We publish articles on 40K and other 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 games, right? Reviews, battle reports, um, opinion pieces from time to time. Uh, we do a lot of meta meta um, analysis on 40K. Um, so that's kind of, I think, one of our flagship article series. Um, I, I'm a contributor for, for Goonhammer. I do battle reports and basic uh, Imperial Guard is kind of the, the, the thing I'm there for. Um, and what was your what was your second question there? And tell us a little bit about the event this last weekend. Um, it's it's kind of I guess it's y'all's like big event y'all do every year. What's the? Yeah. So uh, this year we hosted the Goonhammer Open. It was a inaugural, ideally an annual event. Um, it you know it's just a straight up GT using the GT twenty twenty one mission packs. Um, I think the the two biggest things about this this event was uh, you know we procured full sets of the Vanguard the Vanguard terrain Vanguard tactics terrain sets. So every table had um, a a set layout per mission, uh, which was really great. We can get into that a little bit later. Um, Partly one of the reasons I think I was able to actually win some games with guard here. Um, and the other thing that was really unique about this event that you know we're going to be advertising a lot, we really really liked. Um, so we changed the matchmaking system um, to avoid 
the uh, possibility of submarining. So we did uh, wind path random, which is actually similar to what Nova Nova does for um, for. Matter I like that. I actually like that a lot when you do it because of the fact that submarining is a thing, and I'm. I think that everybody should be pushing. That's just my personal opinion. Push for the max points, but if you don't know who you're playing, because of the randomness, you can just. Anybody can play anybody, so there's no you can't gamesmanship up the parents. Yeah. Also, the really the really nice thing in the other direction is if you are say having you know just not a great time with somebody, you you actually don't have to score. You just have to win. It doesn't really matter if you score that much, because um, then the placings are done with wins. Wins weighted first, win path weighted second, and then battle points weighted third. So the battle points are are pushed down lower in um, in importance. And that's actually why I ended up in fifth, um, because I, I took a first round loss. So, you know, theoretically, my win path is easier, um, but I still managed to be five and one. So I was the lowest, the lowest five win winner because of that. Uh, I think it worked out really well. I think everybody landed exactly where they should have. Um, in the that's tournament. how that's how Games Workshop Orlando did it, right? They did a random uh, within the win group random pairings, I believe. I think they're there's originally was, there's it was random pairings on that, but they had a it was a. They did it second on battle points after to do basically yeah. it, was, it was random wins playing each other and then battle points uh, for the. How does the win path uh, score calculate? Is it based on do they score you based on the people you played? I guess or that's is it... that's skank the schedule. It's win your your win path is what it is. So basically, it, the number of wins you have in a row is weighted heavier. So if you went four wins, then a loss, you would be higher than somebody that went two wins, a loss, then a win. Oh yeah, okay. I remember that now. That, yeah, that's pretty cool, and I guess that's why you uh, you ended up fifth and with a five and one record, which is still phenomenal. I'm excited to talk about it with this uh, with this guard list. Um, Scott, tell us a little bit about the terrain, though. So you kind of alluded to the um, the setup. Can you kind of tell us a little bit about the, how that worked? Yeah. So um, we we basically you know brainstormed a bunch of deployment maps using our our uh, terrain pieces. So the Vanguard Tactics terrain kits all came with eight pieces of terrain. Um, standardized and then uh the the military base set came with two like landing pads and then we supplemented uh to the two other types of sets with a couple of craters um to make some extra terrain uh but we came up with some um basically standardized terrain placement that's part of the event pack that you put in you know other other places have done this i remember last time i was at lvo so i think LVO 2019 had something similar for the top tables. We were just fortunate enough to do it with everything. So, you know, you'd measure from the corner of the ruins to make sure that um, it's a lot like setting up objectives, but you just measure the corner of the ruins and make sure that all of the pieces of terrain are in the right spot. Uh, and the objective of that was to make sure that um, you had the correct, or at least what we felt was the correct terrain density. Um, and Really importantly, make sure you have enough dead or uh, dead, dead space in your deployment zone to hide really anything you want. Um, you know, I had some trouble with that because I had so many vehicles. But you know, say your footprint is gigantic. You're putting a shack size footprint. Yeah, around there. Yeah, you can't really get away with that uh, with guard. But you know, I, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, um, so a lot of many people were able to just hide their their entire army. So uh, that you know that that's that's good, right? That's a good thing. Throw us down. Tell us. Give. Yeah, run us down the uh, what the actual list was, so people know what. Yeah. Besides me, that I'm just staring at it right now, so yeah. I know exactly what it is. Tell everybody um, else. So big, big, big wave tops here. Um, it's three demolisher tank commanders, two full payload manticores, and five tarox primes. Um, so those are that's the meat and potatoes of the list, and then uh, you know a little bit of mashed potatoes on the side. You got or vegetables on the side, I guess. You got thirty guardsmen, and then uh, three minimum squads of Tempestus scions, um, and then you have a smattering of characters in there. So uh, you got just one platoon commander, one Primera psyker, Codiez, and a Tempestor prime. Uh, the Tempestor prime has. Uh, Everybody's in a in a sensible detachment there, so everybody who belongs in in the guard detachment is a custom regiment, um, and they're spotter details and gunnery experts. So uh, they get plus six inches to their heavy weapons range, and they get are rerolling the number of shots 
um, one dice when generating the number of shots for a weapon. Um, and then the all the Scion guys are in a Lambda Lions attachment um, plus one AP. And the temp that gives the Tempestor Prime access to a uh, six inch aura that grants a five up in bone to every Lambda Lions model and a six inch aura to grant reroll ones um, to every Lambda Lions model via a Warlord trait in the Relic. Uh, otherwise, the two psychers are there for um, some smite some smite uh, flex. And then also the other primary job is actually to cast a five up invuln on some guardsmen and then um, use psychic psychic barrier to it give them effectively a four plus invulnerable save. And that's that's kind of that's really how it works. Um, that's the list, and a lot of the objective, a lot of playing the list is just keeping those tank commanders made of tissue tissue paper alive. That's really you said it. you alluded to the terrain being a little beneficial for you for this list. Was that did that go into you building the list, or was that kind of incidental, or what was your process for the terrain in the list? Um, I I really think that. I mean, let's be honest, the guard codex is not really in a great state right now. Um, so I think this is a, about the list you can play with guard no matter what the terrain looks like. Um, there might be some more, there might be some more flex if, you know, there you can go the opposite skew, right? This is kind of a vehicle skew that's going on. You can go the opposite skew to just like 300 bodies, right? You can do that. Um but I, I think the guard codex right now is in a state where you're you're just trying to squeeze the last the last drops out of this thing, right? Um, it you know has it has like a 35 percent win rate in the wild. It's it's not it's not in a great spot. <laughs> so yeah, I feel there's like not a whole lot of options <laughs> really. <laughs> Did so uh, with this terrain setup, you felt like you had a pretty good advantage though with this list. You feel like it kind of gave you a little bit of uh, wiggle room. Um, what the terrain allowed me to do um, was make sure that no tank commander ever got waxed off the first turn. Um, if if you kill a tank commander on the first turn before it does anything with this list, then you you pretty much got to pack it in. Like you you just you just can't lose a tank commander. Yeah, that's just and, too much um, of a valuable asset. Yeah, and and they're really fragile too, which is the other issue, right? So you have to ba they basically just can't get shot, um, or they die, and they also can't get touched either because they're blast weapons. So that's great. <laughs> so so lose lose perfect. Um, Brad, how about you let, run us down the list? So you your one loss first round was to Space Wolves, and Brad's going to read that list off for us here. Let's rock and roll it. A little bit of wolves. We get a chapter master with jump pack, given that full rerolls, Imperium sword, punching people in the face with a frost weapon. Librarian of Phobos armor with the fight last and I'm assuming Stormcrawler. I just assumed it when I looked at it, but he does have murder shirt. No, he's got murder shirt cannon and instincts. Uh, two incursor squads and a soul intercessor squad. Two redemptor dead nuts with standard payout of macro plasma, onslaught, and two storm bolters. We've got three units of Wolf Guard with the jump packs. They've got a little bit of different. They've got storm storm shields and tons of thunder hammers. Woo! So we got a full squad of thunder hammers, a full squad of lightning claws, and then a mixed squad of thunder hammers and lightning claws. Two cyber wolves, a suppressor squad, two eliminator squads, and a long fang squad with full multi maltas in a drop pod. The old hammer down list, uh, little hammer time. That's crazy. Well, it's, it's, a, it's actually funny when I'm reading that list against you. Uh, that list is a little bit off what you typically see with the equipment, but it's really, really good when you're playing a lot of vehicles. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It's a bunch of mobile vehicle slaughterers. Yeah, it's uh, it's brutal. We just got so much strength eight and damage three out there, plus the drop pod with the multi multis. Did you, uh, Scott, when you looked at this, were you thinking this is a, like a bad matchup for you headed in? Uh, actually, I, you know, looking at the list on paper, looking at it on the tray, um, I, I actually evaluated it as it was, it was a good matchup for me. Um, 
and and we can get into that now <laughs> if you want. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah go ahead. And dig I, I love that, that you're about to narrate that. Yeah, and, and Scott was wrong. <laughs> Cave- <laughs> caveat, <laughs> caveat. I was wrong. <laughs> um, so that when we were, I mentioned it earlier. Um, basically, as I'm playing the list I'm playing right now, I just kind of count up the amount of anti tank shooting you have, and if you don't have a lot, then I'm not that worried most of the time um because basically i kind of view combat as if i get in it i die it doesn't really matter what unit it is i kind of just like yeah like it doesn't really matter how hard you kill me you just kind of kind of kill me right um so i see all these thunder hammers and stuff like that i'm kind of like you know what i i figured i was dead anyways if i get in combat like you know tanks even if you touch me don't kill them they're not doing anything anyways um so all i really saw in this list uh was the two redemptors and the four multi meltas and i kind of thought to myself like you know what i can handle that that's that's some shooting i can i can deal with i got my invuln i can park my tarox and minus one to hit um you know i can i can weather that shooting and i can crack back pretty hard if he if he decides to drop that drop pod on the first turn so i thought i matched up pretty well into it um, especially if I, if I went first, uh, you know, I had the, I had the bodies to really box out that multi melt to drop pod and, um, just make it not so great. You know, you have to bring out, you have to bring out those wolf guard to kill like a guardsman squad or something that they get hosed down with Tarox or, uh, you know, they're catching demolisher cans to the face. Like it, it's, yeah, I, I thought it was a good matchup for me. So that was, that was my evaluation going into it. I feel like that's pretty spot on, actually, because I see your reasoning, because it doesn't matter if you have the Thunder Hammer or it's like a Kyranid Hormagon or something. If it mm-hmm. hits you, you're not shooting, and that's all that matters. Yeah, yeah. that makes a lot of sense. The Tarox can play bumper cars a little bit, because they they don't... I mean, I do that a lot. That this happened that happened that game, we can talk about in a little bit. But uh, yeah, they can play bumper cars, because they can just shoot into combat. So if, you know, there's a some infantry or Devastators, or <laughs> hint, hint, some Devastators to charge... <laughs> Um, you can tie them up and you don't really mind because you can just shoot in combat. Why don't you tell us what mission y'all played and kind of the secondaries that both of y'all chose? Yeah, so uh, just pulled that up on ITC Battles. Uh, so round one uh, round one was uh, sweep and clear. So that's corners deployment. You got five objectives, um, one in the center, um, one in each deployment zone, and then two in uh, no man's land in the corners. Um, the objectives I chose were uh, to the last retrieve Octarius data, data and stranglehold. Um, those are pretty typical choices for me. Um, I almost always choose to the last because the tank commanders are so important. If I lose them, if I lose them, it doesn't really, you know, I don't really have a chance anyways. Um, so to the last is a good pick. Uh, retrieve Octarius data, you know, I got those scions. I tend to have an infantry squad in my home quarter that can action so i actually have a good amount of actions available to me so retrieve octarius state is generally pretty good and then stranglehold um on this one you know guard doesn't have a codex so finding that third secondary to choose is always really tough um i i went with stranglehold this time because you know, I got to get after that middle objective. Uh, I, Let I, me some stranglehold. Yeah. Um, I got to get after that middle objective where I'm losing. Uh, so, yeah, it. I don't think it was a great pick, but I think it was one of the things that I could really do. Um, one of the things about playing Marines on this mission is if you just give up the middle, you just kind of lose because they score so many points just by standing there. Um, and then Ian uh, grabbed Oaths of Moment, Direct assault and assassination, which are all really smart picks against me. Obviously, we have that five objective mission and an objective in the middle. So direct assault is is pretty easy. That's the mission secondary. If people aren't familiar, score three points just by holding the middle one. I think it's um, crazy. Let me let me interrupt you just for a second here. I think it's wild. The last four episodes have all been this mission. I just want to point that out. I, I, every time we talk about it, I'm like, oh man, another direct assault. Another direct. It's crazy. This is. I think this is a pretty common one for. Uh, well, this yeah, show. <laughs> yeah, with Marines, with Marines, you can just you can literally just dog yeah, pile the middle objective. Gonna, I'm actually surprised he didn't do direct assault stranglehold though. Then he doesn't even have to interact with you. 
yeah yeah that's that's that that was one of the things i was concerned about because if you go with O's direct stranglehold like you yeah he literally doesn't have to do anything yeah. he doesn't have to he just doesn't acknowledge you at all yeah he, he just can goes, just he could just stand in the middle and score 100 yep, points 100, exactly it's really it's really tough to do and like it's it uh, is hard to kill marines fast enough to keep that from happening right i think um, this is probably like the best army in the game for this mission on those three secondaries yeah. also like i don't think yep. there's a better one than space wolves yeah yeah um so yeah, th- those are the secondaries. Those are the pre-game evaluation. Real quick on this, just so we can talk about the strategy and whatnot for it. <clears throat> was there a piece of terrain on the middle? Like, could you block the middle? Could you see the middle? Yeah, you could see the middle. Um, that was that was one of the things we were really big on um, with with Gunhammer Open is he needed at least the the objectives in neutral ground. You had to you had to if you're standing on them, you got to get shot right because. Um, because yeah, there's it's it is really hard if you can you sneak on to that middle objective on the other side of a ruin or something like that. Like it is, it is actually yeah. I mean, like impossible. especially if there was a piece of terrain, he just could go. Well, go ahead, you can't see me. <laughs> yeah. So the middle, the middle wasn't open, if I recall. There might have been a no. There, there wasn't. The middle was actually just open ground. There was like. There was terrain like right up against the three inch bubble, but if you actually wanted to score it, you had to come to the other side. Um, if I recall, might might have been right up on the nine inch bubble, but yeah, there wasn't any like ruined corner in there or nothing like that. So you are looking to play the, play the trade game all day because he's going to be putting things out there to try to get O's, try to get his dom- direct assault, and you're trying to get him off the strangle. Yeah, it's just when we talk about the strategy and his in his tactics and stuff like that, that it makes a huge difference. If your opponent can take that metal objective from behind something, as opposed to having to come out, as far as your gameplay. Speaking of gameplay and your your plan, tell us about what your your actual strategy was for the mission. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah. So my game plan going into the mission was uh, honestly the first priority was to give him bad shots on those meltas on if he wants to drop it on the first turn. If I, if I see a drop pod full of meltas, that is a game losing condition right there. If I am not super careful about it, right? Because you know, again, they can wax the tank commander right off the bat, um, and I I generally just consider that that's like a, that's a it's a big deal. It's really hard to come back from. <laughs> it's two hundred points. You know, it's hard. Um, so that that was like first strategy. Screen that out, um, and then. Uh, push, push, uh, push out with Tarox and Guardsmen. Um, make him come out and charge with with Van Vets into units that um, I feel like I could trade. Right, so I have more Tarox and more basically Guardsmen than he has the Terminators and Van Vets. So yeah, I'm definitely. I mean, whoa, whoa, the now there. Van Vets got a point <laughs> snare. Wolfguard did not get a point snare. Now don't don't put them and lump them in that bad ple- people land oh sorry yeah um yeah the the wolf guard not the not the van vets um so guys that are exactly the same as the van vets yes. yeah <laughs> <laughs> so i was that's basically what i kind of wanted to do i wanted to make him have to come out and charge me exposed to some counter shooting um you know it was, it was going to be a trade game kind of no matter no matter what um what I was kind of hoping would happen is uh, he'd like really overcommit to that middle there, just kind of dogpile the middle, and I'd be able to shoot him off. Um, but that's not really how the game went. Um, that that's really it. That's all the plan I had. <laughs> you know, it's 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 tough. I can't. I don't. I'm not the the player with what I'd call initiative in in this. Right. I don't have assault units. I don't have anything that can take a charge from his stuff. Um, besides like 34 up invuln guardsmen but even then he, he got a bunch of uh he got the lightning cause wolf guard in there and they're going to take care of those pretty quick even on the floor of invuln so we're looking to pew pew we're basically looking to set up gunfire zones push up take your take that were you just running the scions and the 10 man squads to try to take that middle objective from him um I was I was running I was running the scions and the ten man squads to fill out detachments really, um, 
they're still useful, but yeah. The, right, the, I mean, still it's a bunch of obsec bodies. They can yeah. steal stuff. The 30-man 30, 30 guards. Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, no, no. I just, I, I apologize for interrupting on that. I just, I was thinking the fact that he's going to go so heavy in the middle makes me think that maybe you want to take one of his, you know, his no man's land or even a home field objective for your stranglehold at that point in time. Yeah. Um, all the guardsmen disappeared pretty quick, though, so they didn't really get the chance to do that but yeah the the idea was was to drop obsec onto that middle objective um the hard part with playing space wolves is you can't really sneak objectives away from them right because they got the heroic intervention right so that's a, that's a huge thing yeah, the you fact that just, they can get a six inch heroic too that's yeah a that's that's the other issue you kind of just got to sneak them off like or shoot them off you can't really like yeah, it's it's hard to sneak. A lot of times, when playing these guardsmen and whatnot, I'm you know I'm just gonna move, move, move a couple obsec bodies onto an objective to like flip it at the end of the turn. I don't actually charge. Um, yeah, so you, you just can't really do that with space wolves. So, but ten ten guardsmen weren't able to take on a full wolf guard unit. That's crazy talk. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Now, just kind of walk us through the game from from point one to point B. I just said one to B. Oh my gosh. Yeah. From part from point A to point B. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I got you. Um, so kind of in summary, uh Ian got first turn, uh, which is already bad for guard. Um and he he so the way I the way I deployed, right? I, I deployed guardsmen out um along the line to screen out that drop pod as much as possible. I measured back into my deployment zone such that the melted guns couldn't even fire on tank commanders or manticores on the first turn even if he did drop his drop pod um i didn't i didn't really think he would on the first turn because i wasn't really giving him any shots um the tarox and the tempester prime dog piled uh touching our our bit of dense terrain so um, that was kind of on the left side of my deployment zone. All the tanks were in the very back corner, just based off of how measurements worked out. And then, yeah, I had a guardsman squad stringing along the side of each of those. Um, Ian deployed with one of the Redemptors um, kind of on each side of a just massive Space Wolf dog pile nine inches off the center with just everything in there. Every single vanguard, every it, like every character, everything was like in just that like nine inch clump there, and then the redemptors were kind of two sides flanking that, so they could each kind of come around an L that was kind of in his deployment zone. Um, so the way first turn went, um, he got first turn. He brings out both redemptors. Uh, some of the vanguard are, are hopping to other pieces of terrain, generally staying out of line of sight, trying to approach me. Um, he brings in the drop pods, which I was actually, I was really surprised about because um, the only shooting it had was on the Tarox, right? Um, and, and you know, he's kind of light on anti-tank. So I was actually happy to see the drop pods come in. Um, he has keen senses too, so the, the minus one doesn't matter too much. But uh, at that point, I wasn't, I wasn't too worried. Uh, I figured that between that whole squad, like, I think I'd lose like one and a half Tarox for that squad, and then I'd lose like another Tarox between the two Redemptors because they are actually suffering the minus one to hit um, with the Invuln. Um, so uh, he blew up three Tarox, so that was a little unexpected for me. Um, I didn't really plan for that. And then because three Tarox got killed, that opened up a shot from his uh, eliminators onto my Tempester Prime. He killed my Tempester Prime on the first turn, so things are going really bad. Oh, ouch. Yeah, yeah things are going really bad. Um, killed both Guardsmen squads because he, he like really aggressively uh, set up the Incursors. Um, so actually both Incursor squads were out, killed the, the, the Prime, killed three Tarox, um, and... You know, now now I have I'm down three Tarox going into my turn. Uh, I have incursors on my line. I have the devs right there. I think actually one of the van vets also made a charge in on the first turn, if I recall. So there's a lot to deal with, right? I got both redemptors out, um, and I, I have 
the resources available to, to address this, I basically have two Taroks, three tank commanders, and a Manticore. Um, cause, and, and one guardsman squad that was like down to five or six dudes or something like that. The Scions are in deep strike for the retrieve Octarius data. Um, so when I'm, in, when I'm in a situation where I don't have enough shooting or enough resources to address a problem immediately, um, I, I think to myself, what are the ways that I can delay a problem, right? How can I make it a problem for next turn? Um, cause that, after that first, that first round there, I was kind of like, this is already kind of looking like a loss, but I can play a long game and maybe I can come back, right? Like maybe I can score well enough uh, on the later turns to, uh, to really turn this around. Um, so, uh, I set up one Tarox to charge the Devastators, another Tarox just kind of ran away, um. Tank commanders lined up shots on the Redemptors, so one on each Redemptor, um, and then one on, I think, an exposed Van Bet squad. And then, um, you know, I brought Kodiaz over to one of the Incursor squads to try and take care of them. And, uh, you know, Manticores kind of stayed put. Uh, results of that were one Redemptor dead, one Redemptor down to one wound, um, and then uh, after shooting. <laughs> and then, um, I think I killed, I think I killed like one or two of the van vets, um, but the third tank commander bounced off of off of the van vets, um, which was also rough. Um, then I set up to charge the Tarox into those devastators, just to tie him up, shut him up for a turn, um, and he overwatched the Tarox and blew up the Tarox. That was on, so he's hitting on Bold sixes move, and he just, <laughs> yeah. yeah rolling hot yeah uh so that was a big problem because <laughs> not only did i lose a fourth tarox now i have multi-melted devastators not tied up near my tank commanders so that was, was there did you have a squad of guardsmen that could have uh that could have gotten up on them or was that no uh, not they're all for you they're all dead because they the incursors uh oh, killed them right. all yeah, because he he deployed him right off of my uh, right off of my line. So that was a smart move on his part, really, to have those incursors up t up tight and taking out the the little boys, mm -hmm. so that he could prevent the the counter the counter push onto yeah. your onto his devs. Yeah. Um. So yeah, basically the board state going into top of two was I had one Tarox, three tank commanders, two Manticores left. Um. And then I had some characters, and he had, uh, basically everything. Um, except for the Redemptors. The Redemptors were pretty degraded, so I, I did manage to kill them. But, you know, now we have Van Bets and, and, and the Melta squad, and all I have left are tanks, right? Um, so that's a rough situation. Now, was the terrain, was he able to basically go across the board invisible to you with, with the way the terrain was out? Were those vanguards able to jump from feature to feature without being targeted by the uh, tank commanders? Uh yeah yeah largely until they like got into my deployment zone, then they're then like they can't avoid being shot. Um, one of the issues one of the issues I I had was actually that on that first turn right they did actually bounce, um, bounce tank commanders. Um, but it it I honestly I only expect to kill two or three with tank commander. The issue was that you know there was five and even if there's two left you know we talked about it earlier even if they're not yeah. killing me. If they touch me, it's a big issue. Um, so yeah, yeah, you're toast if you yeah. if, he, if, they, if one of them touches you, it's it's an issue because then you're you're losing a whole turn of 200 points of shooting, which is what those mm -hmm. boys are there to yep. do. So. And and also the the other issue at this point with the board state is I was so packed in into that very back corner that you're gonna touch multiple things. So each like guy that's around is shutting down 400 points of shooting or something, even if he gets in there. Where do you perceive in all of this? Where do you perceive was like the the error that maybe set you up for this uh, going into turn two? Like, was there something you could have done different? You feel like that would have set you up for a better play? The I feel like I feel like I would have had a chance in this game still, even even with this board state, if the devastators weren't weren't shooting again. That was the that was the biggest mistake for me. Um, I was just about to say I would have definitely put those guys as my one of my number one priorities was there another option for 
uh, in that turn also, uh, if you kill the Devastators and then spread out just a little bit more to try to minimize that, the, the yeah. touching back, because you yeah, could have zoomed away a little bit. I could have basically weathered the Redemptor shooting again. Yeah, so there's there's a few options that, that I, I evaluated there. Was, uh, do I allow the Redemptors to shoot again and instead try and kill the Devastators? Um, because I, I evaluated that I had, you know, I could kill the Devastators, like maybe wound a Redemptor, take care of the Van Vets that were in front of me. Um, but basically how how I committed to playing that turn was I shot both Tarox and a Tank Commander onto a Van Vet squad, the one that was like right on my deployment line. Um, and then I was going to charge a Tarox into, one Tarox into the Incursor squad and another Tarox into the Devastator squad. And then um, I wanted to work work that mid board stuff, um, so the Redemptors and the character pile and the other elite infantry that were scoring his oaths, um, because I I kind of felt like we talked about it earlier. If you don't if you don't remove them from the center, they just score 100 points, right? Um, so that that's kind of what I went for. Um, but I think the more conservative play to get me farther into the game, which is what I'm always trying to do if I feel like I'm down on the board state, right? Just get, stay in the game longer, take your next shot. Um, what I probably should have done is just re-hit everything behind like my home ruin. Um, just try and address the stuff in my deployment zone and ignore the Redemptors for another turn. Um, so that that would have been another play. Another another thing to do would have been, you know, charge multiple Tarox. To the into the devastators um so one of the things that i'm going to do going forward if i ever intend on tying something up i'm going to make sure i have two units to charge them right um that was just kind of a that i didn't expect to even get overwatched and i certainly didn't expect to die on overwatch so um i need to make sure i have a backup unit if there's that if there's like a critical game losing condition out there i need to make sure that i, I never hit that condition and that's yeah that's pretty good insight there because i think that's a thing we see a lot with um on the show you know people talking about a loss like there's a critical moment and they they put something that was statistically supposed to live into something critical and it died and then uh, they didn't have a backup plan and i think that it's having like a simple backup plan of just like something a second cheap option to double charge and uh and I'll tell you, that's that's been a big take home for me personally as a player from this show. Is I always have some little junk unit with just running along with something that I want to uh, blockade out. So, yeah, in this case, it was a little tougher because I only had the two Tarox, right? I was like really running low on units. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I definitely think like the biggest takeaway. I've I've learned this before. I'm going to learn it again and again and again. If I'm if I ever find a game losing condition, make that a zero percent chance, right? Like. I don't know what the chances are losing losing a full vehicle on Overwatches to eight melted guns, um, but I don't think it's very high. Um, yeah. So I I shouldn't have let it happen in the first place, honestly. Scott, there's something that we talk about at the end of the show over time, and it's we talk to players. How do you analyze a loss after you take one? So like you go home, you're thinking about it. What's your process for looking at the loss and learning from it? Uh. What do I, how do I learn from losses? Um, I don't know. Um, let me think, let me think on that for a moment. Uh, I've been, I've been taking a lot of losses in ninth edition with guard. So it's it looks like you've learned from us. That's him. Mean, you're, you're five and one here. To yeah. Good, and well, this, this awesome. is actually, this is actually the too. first time. This is the first time I've found any success with guard in ninth edition, to be honest. I've been playing a lot, but like playing home games, like I, I've been regularly getting smashed by everybody i regularly play with so um how how do i evaluate a loss the first thing the first thing i do um i look for um i i, I really look for what i consider was the decisive point right and and i think backwards from that so i look at where in the game was i bodied out where do i never get where do i never recover and then i go you know if if that's n if you know, if decisive moment is is time n, I look at n minus one, then n minus two, n minus three, all the way back to the start of the game, and I think where were the decision points I had to avoid that decisive point for that loss? 
Um, because that's generally how I think about winning games is I, I think about getting to a decisive point and and basically pushing somebody out of being able of of removing their agency to win. Right. Um, so I, I go I go to what I thought was the decisive point of that that specific game. And then I, I think on how to avoid it. Um, so for this one, how I evaluated the decisive point of that was. You know, losing the Tarox on Overwatch was probably the decisive point because that resulted in, you know, that was 150 points of loss. That was I had another 200 points of loss because of that, and I had incursors and band bets that were like tying tying tanks up the next turn. Right. Um, You're doing some uh, some algebra here on us. We're gonna get you on math hammer. <laughs> in, I was in, getting excited about this. I thought he was gonna be one the of power those. Of X. Now he's yeah, gonna we're... be one of those dudes that just basically. East, dedicates his whole life to 3n plus one and has, has the graphs out for me no sorry <laughs> yeah i think i think scott just went blind and just wrote some equations you can't see it but he has he has a whole chalkboard behind him he just has like a um a uh, beautiful mind like uh, algorithm back there writing up awesome scott well thanks for coming on man we really enjoyed having you and we'll definitely be, be doing the brad hour part two here shortly so make sure to join us for that um typically we do a q a here at the end of the episode of part one but for all those listening, we are going to open Scott's part two open to everyone this week. So I'm, we're going to put it into part two, and we're going to just uh, just hammer it home there. So for those who don't know, the part of the Q&A that we do at the end of the episode is available to War Room members at theartofwar40k.com. You can go there, you can subscribe, and it's a Facebook group. There's clinics by all the coaches, Nick Navadi, Brad Chester, Richard Siegler, John Lennon. They all go on there, and they do different clinics every week for different factions, different play styles, different missions. And uh, also, it's just a forum for like-minded people to just communicate and talk. And you can post questions to Unbroken, which, in my opinion, is the best perk. So we will see you in part two. Before we go, make sure to check out theartofwar40k.com. Check out our other podcasts. We have The Art of War Vanilla with John Lennon and Tim Penny. We have The Art of War Down Under with the late and great Adam Camilleri. And of course, we are the Art of War Unbroken, the pistachio of the Art of War family. You didn't know you loved us till you tried us. Thanks for listening. Join us for part two. Like what you just listened to? Check out Art of War and the Art of War Down Under podcast on the competitive 40K network. The Art of War 40K.com. 